Welcome. Uh, I'm Shinobu Kitema. I'm the interim director of the Center for Japanese Studies. I'd like to start with one quick announcement. Uh, this coming week on, on Thursday, September the 30th, uh, we are going to have a speaker from Japan, Seiichiro Aso, a journalist working in Japan. Uh, he's uh, going to discuss differences between Japan and China, perspectives from Japanese journalism from 1980 to the present. Now, because he's uh, joining us uh, from Japan by Zoom, uh, this event begins at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So, uh, and, and this talk is given in Japanese and we provide English translation. For future programs, uh, please refer to, uh, please look at uh, CJS website and various social media. Now, I like to ask you uh, to turn off your microphone uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, no noise uh, interferes uh, with the event. And you can use Q&A uh, tab on the bottom of your screen to, uh, to offer your questions. After the presentation, I'm going to uh, read those questions one by one, uh, as many questions as possible, so that we can have uh, interesting conversation. All right, so I, I hope everything is clear. Now, I'm very, very excited to introduce our speaker today, Professor Dick Samuels. Uh, he's one of the most prominent political scientists studying Japan and Asia today. His PhD is from MIT uh, in 1980. He's now the Ford International Professor of Political Science at his alma mater, MIT, directing its uh, Center for International Studies. He's been very, very prominent in the field of Japan and the politics of Japan. He has a series of highly influential books on politics and the business in Japan, government responses to Tohoku earthquakes aftermath and Japan's national security. He has also played many important roles. For example, uh, he served uh, as a vice chair of the Committee on Japan of the National Research Council. For all these contributions to the study of Japan, he was awarded the Order of Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star. He has also been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Today, he'll be discussing his latest book, on the intelligence community in Japan. So please help me welcome Professor Samuels. Thanks very much, Shinobu, and, and thanks to everyone uh, in Ann Arbor for arranging this and to John Campbell, who got the ball rolling uh, and can't be with us today. Uh, so those of you who have read, uh, who may have read my work or have heard me before, uh, know that I've been keeping track uh, of how the Japanese go government has slowly been unwinding its very long list of self-imposed uh, constraints on the conduct of its national security policy during the post-war period. And the, the alternative of unwinding <clears throat> is a German metaphor, uh, the, the term salami tactic, uh, just taking small slices one at a time until the salami loaf is gone. Um, and there has been, in, in fact, um, uh, there have been decades, this has been going on for, for decades. And I want to use this to set the context uh, for today's discussion of the intelligence community. So I'm going to run through this first list rather quickly, but I'm happy to return to it if uh, to any of these points uh, during the Q&A if, if there's an interest. Um, so as most of you know, Japan for many years had no de proper defense ministry until it did. Uh, it ruled out the military use of space. Uh, until it didn't. Article 9, uh, I'm sorry, it, 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 its prime minister won the Nobel Peace Prize for ruling out nuclear weapons with its three non-nuclear principles until it was clear that the door remains open. 
uh, Article 9 was reinterpreted, was interpreted as ruling out offensive weapons until it was uh, reinterpreted. Uh, the Japanese government barred the export of, uh, of weapons uh, until it ended that, that self-imposed constraint and, and the ban was lifted. Uh, the government insisted that the constitution prohibited collective self-defense until the government uh, reinterpreted uh, the constitution. So, uh, and, and finally, Japan famously limited its defense spending to under 1% of GDP, uh, a constraint that has been abandoned first by Prime Minister Suga, actually first by Prime Minister Abe, reinforced uh, by Prime Minister Suga and, uh, and endorsed by the candidates uh, who are trying to replace him now. So the point is that all of this was accomplished without revision of the constitution. Uh, so however important the constitution has been symbolically, and it has been, uh, Article 9 was not an insurmountable, insurmountable policy constraint after all. And it's worth noting, as I say, that, that the LDP candidates are, 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 are all on board um, to, uh, to embrace each of these uh, uh, slackened constraints. So all that's left really uh, on, on Japan's post-war intelligence constraint list uh, is the post-war intelligence taboo. Uh, and that's the subject of, uh, of the book and, and what I wanna talk with you about today. So the question is, I'm gonna do it in historical perspective. So what has been the historical arc of, of Japan's uh, intelligence community? And actually, it's, it's been more like a sine curve. Uh, it, it's the history of the intelligence community is one in which Japan's um, uh, infrastructure, intelligence infrastructure expanded and then receded and now is uh, poised to expand again. And uh, what I try to do is, is, is provide a, a bit of a historiography for, for this. Um, and by dividing this up into, into five periods. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through those periods. I'll review each, uh, just really flicking at them uh, in connection with the core, each of the, to the extent possible, each of the six core elements. But those six elements that are key to the book and to the story um, are the collection of intelligence, the analysis of intelligence, communication and coordination across levels of government of, of intelligence, counterintelligence in most countries, covert activity, and finally oversight of intelligence. Um, now, uh, let me start with that first period and, and I'm, I apologize for, I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly and, and pretty superficially so we can come back and, and try to do better in, in the Q and A. Um, the expansion of the Japanese intelligence community in the first half of the 20th century was overdetermined. Just let me stipulate that. It was, after all, a time of global power shifts, a time of empire, a time of technological revolution, each of and, fa and, and intelligence failures. Anyway, the point is that these are all elements and phenomena that are everywhere key drivers of intelligence reform. Point is that uh, Japan was an earlier early adopter of technology intensive signals intelligence. It had its first successes with that. Uh, during the first Sino-Japanese War. It also focused on human intelligence during this period. Uh, Japan's senior diplomats uh, and its general officers pioneered area studies. And I'm saying this to the University of Michigan's Center for Japanese Studies, which was the pioneer for Japanese studies in the United States, I'm aware of that. But they pioneered area service in the studies in the service of intelligence collection and analysis and nurtured the careers of deeply knowledgeable area specialists who developed impressive open source and some covert, but particularly impressive, the ones we know about, uh, intelligence capabilities. And Japan also had notable success early with covert action, uh, as in the work of the fabled uh, Akashi Motojiro, whose photograph is on the left here on your screen. He, he, he was most famous, he was famous for a lot of things, but uh, he, was, he was particularly famous um, for organizing exiled political op opponents of the Tsar across Central Europe uh, and supporting them. Uh, but at just the moment when European states were beginning to, European states were beginning to professionalize 
uh, their intelligence services, Japan began to consign its intelligence officers uh, to a back bench. Uh, the military and the foreign ministry came, uh, rose uh, and, and closed down uh, uh, other, uh, other in institutional options. And they came to depend also on somewhat disreputable and self-serving ruffians uh, known as the, in English as the continental adventurers. We all, we all know them as the tidy kudonin. Uh, who collected information and generated instability in, in roughly equal measure. Uh, the covert activity of innumerable special duty units, the tokumuki uh, that this is the term that, that inspired the title of the book project and is popularized in the manga uh, magazine in, in, the, uh, uh, in the middle of the screen, uh, was aimed at supporting coups d'etat in Korea, assassinating warlords in China, and nurturing national resistance, uh, national resistance movements in, in South and in Southeast Asia. Uh, and toward that, I direct your attention to Subras Chandra Bose, whose photo uh, in front of the rising sun um, is, is on the right side of your screen. Um, we can talk about him, we can talk about any of this uh, uh, later on, but civilian military intelligence cooperation during this period was famously limited. Uh, and, and the most costly of all stovepipes was fed by competition within the Japanese, within the Japanese military itself. And the bill for the inability of the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy to coordinate intelligence collection and analysis uh, came due uh, after Midway, particularly at first came due after Midway in 1942. And then later during the Battle of Lady Gulf in October of 1944, when each actively sabotaged or at a minimum ignored the other's intelligence. But there were a great many other failures, uh, most notably in, in counterintelligence. And uh, uh, Richard Zorga is probably the best uh, example, um, the, Soviet, the, the case of the Soviet spy, uh, Zorga, uh, is probably the most famous counterintelligence lapse ever. Uh, he operated under the impeccable protection and cover of the German embassy in Tokyo, as, as many of you know. Uh, he grew up in Berlin uh, and, and working with very well-placed and highly idealistic uh, Japanese colleagues. He passed on Japan's Manchurian order of battle to Moscow, and he provided advanced warning of Japan's 1937 invasion of China. Here uh, in, this, in this photo uh, or in this slide, uh, Zorge is, is memorialized as a hero of the Soviet Union. It's an East German stamp, postage stamp. Um, now, at the war's end, uh, the Japanese intelligence community, like the imperial military, was, was dismantled. Uh, we all know that. Uh, and it was for a short time. We also know that. Um, but it's true that during the occupation, and even well after Japan regained sovereignty, Japan had to accommodate to two new facts uh, 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 of life for itself and for its future. The first was subordination to the United States. And the second is the clear and insistent public opposition to any practice redolent of wartime governance. Um, supervision by Washington generated resentment in the Japanese intelligence community throughout the Cold War, which actually felt more infantilized than reborn. Um, some in the community referred to it as a master-servant relationship, the US being obviously the master. Uh, and, and this became a more persistent problem as I detail in the book uh, than is commonly and normally acknowledged. But it wasn't always clear who was manipulating whom um, throughout this, this period. Uh, General MacArthur's lovable fascist, those are MacArthur's words, and he's describing um, uh, General Charles Willoughby here, uh, the photo on the right, uh, he, who was the G2, he was running SCAP intelligence, um, Willoughby nurtured his own rogues gallery uh, of unsavory former military intelligence officers, Arisue Seizo here, uh, Kawabe Torashiro and Hattori uh, Takushiro. Um, and they convinced the surprisingly incredulous uh, Willoughby that they were, they were reliable. Uh, and he protected each uh, from, from the purges and the war crimes tr trials. And in any event, they didn't seem all that concerned 
uh, and worried about Japan's surrender, at least if you look at this picture here of, uh, of, of uh, Arisue. Um, there is this, this photograph I've, I've highlighted uh, him smoking. This is, this is the day um, that, that he, uh, it was in Atsugi in August of 1945, just after the surrender, he seems utterly relaxed, smoking a big stogie. Um, uh, he had already buried documents and weapons just in case Japan caught a second wind. Um, uh, and during the Cold War, uh, the, Japanese, um, uh, the Japanese intelligence community was directed uh, to focus on US concerns, uh, most notably counterintelligence uh, related first to a possible nationalist resurgence, except these guys were excluded from, from their concern, shouldn't have been, and then directed at communist agitation as the Cold War set in. Um, the, the Japanese intelligence community was also handicapped by the extent to which the public, the Japanese public, was, uh, had no longer had a stomach for war, it no longer had a stomach for the military, and it no longer uh, had a stomach even for discussion of national security affairs. So politicians shied away from demanding national intelligence estimates uh, and avoided public discussion about intelligence. And this is, of course, a, the, the, the iconic photo of the AMPO demonstrations in June 1960. But meanwhile, uh, there was intelligence going on. There was counterintelligence that should have been done. The Soviet Union described and Soviet retired Soviet agents described Japan uh, as spy heaven uh, because it leaked like a sieve to them. Uh, but it was a fine line to walk. Uh, the Japanese security community and the intelligence units within it uh, were aligned with the United States to be sure. Uh, but the politicians had to also accommodate to anti-militarist sentiment at home as well as unwelcome demands uh, from Washington. And so not surprisingly, uh, there was backlash. And one manifestation of this, and this is an iconic photo, of course, of Mishima Yukio, but one, one uh, manifestation of this backlash was the willingness of some Japanese patriots, I use that, I guess, in ironic quotes, to undermine the status quo, uh, sometimes with the support of individuals in the intelligence community. The most prominent example was uh, uh, probably Mishima Yukio, uh, and it was the support for him uh, that he received, and his, his uh, tate, tate no Kai, his, his shield society, his, his troops, um, uh, his private army, uh, the support he got from at least one intelligence officer in, in the ground self-defense forces uh, who lectured Mishima's uh, troops, again, ironic quotes, uh, on psychological warfare um, at, at uh, ground self-defense force facilities. But rather than being punished when this was discovered, this colonel was promoted to major general uh, after Mishima's ill-conceived coup d'etat failed. Uh, a different case, uh, the ultimately aborted kidnapping of South Korean president, uh, or at that time, South Korean dissident, uh, uh, Kim Dae-jung uh, from a Tokyo hotel room was much more dramatic um, even if it was less theatrical uh, than, uh, than Mishima's uh, coup. And it seems to have been abetted by uh, Japanese operatives uh, from uh, a CIA funded, jointly run secret US Japanese intel operation called the, informally called the Musashi Kikan. Uh, and, and, and these operatives informed the KCIA where Kim was hiding in Akasaka Mitsuke. And he was, he was scooped up and rescued uh, by, uh, by the United States, as it turned out, by, uh, by US, US military. But the chief cabinet secretary at the time uh, was post-war Japan's most determined intelligence reformer. Uh, that was Gotoda Masaharu. Uh, he was a former home ministry official who had worked his way through the intelligence bureaucracy and then shifted over to the political, to the political class and reached the highest levels of the LDP uh, and, and advised the intelligence officer who fingered Kim uh, to lay low for a while. So here is Gotoda with, when he was chief cabinet secretary with his prime minister, Nakasone Yasuhiro. 
Uh, now, together, they tried in 1985 to introduce an anti-espionage law, uh, but they ran into very stiff public opposition. Uh, and I think of this as sort of an imperfect but and non-institutionalized, but surprisingly stout form of oversight. Uh, their effort was undone by public fears that an anti-espionage law would set Japan onto a slippery slope to wartime surveillance and wartime controls and war military power. So as I see it, while this portended there would be little intelligence uh, reform for a while, it also indicated that, that the new democratic order was growing roots. The electorate was going to be heard. Uh, and and this, was an, this was an important moment. Along the way then, uh, Japan's Cold War intelligence community was essentially it just essentially devolved into sort of a bureaucratic scrum. It was characterized by competitive and mutually incompatible intelligence units, uh, characterized by, by that, um, and, and operated under what for many was the increasingly annoying direction uh, of the United States. Indeed, Gotoda in his memoirs is very clear about this. He was often openly annoyed. And in 1983, uh, after Japan's military intelligence intercepted uh, Kremlin's orders to shoot down a, a commercial Korean jetliner, the famous case of the KAL 007, uh, an ironic, an ironic uh, uh, flight number. Uh, Gotoda learned that the self-defense forces had been routinely sharing signal intelligence with Washington before sharing it uh, with the cabinet. And so he unceremoniously pulled the plug and ended the, ended the practice. Now, here on the left is an even older and uh, surely even wiser um, uh, Gotoda, uh, who even after retiring and after the Cold War remained dedicated uh, to centralizing the intelligence community, to building it and building it up and, and centralizing it. Um, and he uh, and he was committed to building what he re commonly referred to as uh, the longest rabbit ears. Uh, that Japan could grow and support. In the mid 1990s, Gotoda very cleverly hitched plans for intelligence reform to Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Hashimoto Ryutaro's uh, popular, very popular administrative reforms. And he bet that the Japanese public had become almost as disenchanted with bureaucrats as they were with the militarists, who by then um, had receded further and further in their rearview mirrors. So he, and he, read the, he read the mood carefully. In January, 1997, Japan stood up its defense intelligence headquarters, focusing on signals and images. But the new unit soon failed a major test when a North, North Korea uh, flew a Tepo Dong-1 through Japanese airspace in September, 1998. So now, finally, uh, Japanese politicians in Tokyo, Tokyo's politicians, uh, took the bit between their teeth, uh, and within months, the government abandoned its long-standing ban uh, uh, on the military use of space and initiated a spy satellite program, formally. Uh, but in an awkward arrangement entirely consistent with Japan's history of intelligence stovepiping and silos, the program was placed under the nominal control of a police officer. So this is just more evidence that during the first post-Cold War decade, Japan would content itself with tinkering, uh, with tinkering with an underpowered intelligence community. Meanwhile, uh, one signature event gyrated into a sort of a convulsive national trauma. Uh, and that was the kidnapping of, of innocent youths from Japanese seaside communities by North Korean agents. Rather than yet another case in which the intelligence community uh, failed the policy community. Here, we learn what can happen when policymakers fail to heed the intelligence community. The police and possibly other government intelligence agencies may have acquiesced. There are reports, uh, and we have a, I have it both by interview, but also uh, published reports, um, that a senior LDP and opposition party politicians who sought normalized relations with North Korea uh, as well as even Communist Party officials who were no negotiating their own rapprochement with Pyongyang, uh, stifled 
any uh, public accounting. And uh, of the uh, and, and this particular, not just this particular incident, but Rachimondai in general. And on the counterintelligence front, uh, we also recall during this period how politicians stood aside, letting bureaucrats and bureaucratic obstacles block the public security intelligence agency from disabling uh, the murderous Ong Shinrikyo cult before it snuffed out 13 lives on a Tokyo subway in March, 1995. So for many, it was high time for Japan to stop tinkering and to start to reimagine intelligence and counterintelligence. Nine Eleven helped to accelerate this, to make it seem more urgent to the political class and indeed to the public in Japan. Uh, by the 2000s, as the threats associated with the New World Order, this is post-Cold War now, uh, were clarifying themselves, these, these threats, uh, the public mood turned quite critical of the government for its insufficient intelligence capabilities. U.S. pressure, personified in the photo on the right by, by Deputy uh, Secretary of State, then Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage, um, and then Foreign Minister uh, Machimura Nobutaka, uh, was not insignificant. That is US pressure was not insignificant. But clearly the United States was pushing at that, by that time was pushing on an open door. Uh, a small industry dedicated to intelligence reform had already begun to emerge uh, to reimagine the Japanese intelligence community. The media, think tanks and scholars argued seriously for comprehensive intelligence reform. One example, uh, which uh, you can easily pull up online is an influential essay. And I, I only mention it because of the prominence of it, one of its authors, uh, an influential, influential essay in 2013 in Chuo Koron uh, by Kono Taro and, and two colleagues, each from different parties. Uh, but the obstacle had in fact, and I mentioned this also because the obstacle had by this time clearly become a leadership, political leadership. An eagerly pro-reform generation of leaders had yet to fully consolidate power. So in just the first six years after the retirement of Prime Minister Koizumi uh, in 2006, Japan had seven prime ministers, 11 foreign ministers, and 16 defense ministers from two major political parties. Some prime ministers like Abe Shinzo, more about whom in a moment, uh, were, were quite enthusiastic for intelligence reform, but others like Fukuda Yasuo uh, were much more cautious. Uh, until Abe returned to power in early 2013, the endemic failures uh, of intelligence units to communicate with one another and of the intelligence community as a whole to communicate effectively with the political class continued to block any re-engineering, serious re-engineering uh, of the intelligence community. But by the second decade of this century, the diffusion of, of a global power came into much sharper uh, focus for Japanese strategists. Post-Cold War threats that were limited at first uh, to non-state actors and to terrorism uh, gave way to an even more consequential shift in the regional and indeed global uh, balance of power, which was the rise of China and the relative decline of the United States. And for good measure, you can throw in the nuclearization of North Korea, North Korean military. So once Abe returned to power, which was coming, it wasn't there in 2013, but it was coming along fast. And once Abe returned to power in 2013, he moved in several directions simultaneously uh, to, to expand Japan's intelligence capabilities. And the most consequential of his moves, I think, uh, were the creation in 2013 of the National Security Council, it actually really the twin pillars uh, of intelligence reform. First, the designated state secrets law, uh, and then uh, the, the establishment of the National Security Council. The former, that is the state secrets law, uh, created Japan's first, post-war Japan's first official document classification system and the latter, that is the creation of the National Security Council, um, was a sweeping reform 
of foreign policy decision making, which included the creation of the National Security Secretariat in the Prime Minister's office to streamline communication across intelligence units and between the intelligence and the policy world. The, the problems that I've already identified were recognized. They were not, they were no secret. This was not a, I didn't reveal something to you that the Japanese didn't know and feel, uh, feel they understood were problematic uh, from the get-go, but now uh, they were prepared finally uh, to do something about it. So together, this was a frontal assault on longstanding impediments to effective intelligence, uh, to, to effective intelligence full stop. Uh, importantly, the political costs were contained and, and the institutional changes were accepted by, uh, by the public. There was a, there were, uh, Prime Minister Abe took a, a, short, a, a short hit, a, a small hit in his support, and then it went back to where it had been in short order. Politicians, even those eager to become prime minister now, have openly discussed joining, having Japan join the Five Eyes uh, Consortium, which would be a major step, uh, which we can discuss during the Q&A, should you wish. But suddenly, intelligence reform by, by then uh, had, a, had, a, had and still has a new spring in its step. So let me, let me end uh, and, and uh, look forward to your questions. Let me just say this. Uh, there is much more that, I'm, that I'd like to share with, with you, but I really want to give you all a, a chance to react to what you've heard and to open, open a converse, larger conversation. So let me end where I end the book, uh, which is with the wisdom of the classical historian Herodotus, who taught that the, and these are, this is a quote from him, uh, that the worst pain one can suffer is to have insight into much and power over nothing. And my takeaway uh, from studying the past 125 years of the Japanese intelligence community is that the reverse, that is having power over much but insufficient insight can also be, or can be equally painful. Uh, Japan has suffered under both, both, both imbalances. Um, during its imperial expansion, Japan had great power, but limited insight. And during the American century, it had greater insight, often derivative from the United States, but its power was much more limited, it still is. And I wanna stress that this is not a unique tale. This is the last thing I wanna say, is by no means you know, uh, specific to Japan. Not having struck an, an effective balance between power and insight, has not only inflicted great costs on Japan and its neighbors historically, but also on the United States and its targets during its own imperial moment, as we've painfully, painfully observed uh, in Iraq and even more recently in Afghanistan. So let me let me stop there and and look forward to answering uh, any questions you may have to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, just wonderful talk. So uh, let me start uh, with uh, one question uh, while waiting for other people jumping in. Uh, obviously, I was not born when uh, you know, World War II and the preceding period was unfolding. But my understanding of uh, what happened but that people became, well, people became very pissed off, so to speak, by the intelligence community back then, because intelligence community, intelligence mechanisms were employed uh, for the purpose of oppression within Japan. Uh, and now it, you are, well, intelligence community reform in the more, more recent years, especially, uh, well, surely after the World War II and in the more recent decades uh, is a reaction to external threat. Now, my question is whether and to what extent Japan, well, Japanese public could now be reassured of there's an enemy within the inside that is uh, intelligence community, that is a mechanism for oppression. Uh, I, I think that's, a, uh, that's one concern many Japanese people might have, and surely I do. 
Uh, I, I wonder if you have any insight on this. I, I mean, that's a great question. And, and um, I'm not sure how valuable my insight is other than to say um, that I think you've got it right, which is that it's not just that they were pissed off by the intelligence community as a whole, um, but especially by counterintelligence units, which directed their power uh, counterintelligence by nature, they're doing, not by nature, but much counterintelligence by nature is, is domestic. Um, and uh, they, were, they were, as you say, during the wartime, uh, d- directing their, their, their power um, against Japanese citizens uh, inter alia. And, uh, and the Japanese public did not forget that. Um, so this is why I talk about the need for the post-war intelligence community to have uh, to make two kinds of accommodations. One, to the fact that they were a junior partner to the United States during the Cold War, but also that um, they were not trusted uh, by uh, by the general population sufficiently to allow them to to build the kind of intelligence community uh, that they would have wished to have. And that had consequences, Um, that had consequences. Uh, but it's, it's, you're absolutely right. It's not just, and it has never just been a reaction to external threat. Um, how is one to reassure the Japanese population that it's not going to happen again? Um, I think that's, that's sort of front of reformers, far, front on the, the foreheads, if you like the met- metaphor, it's kind of a loose metaphor, but front on the foreheads of reformers and has been for a long time especially after the 1985 anti-espionage law failed. Now, I looked at the, the discourse um, uh, and the, de- the debate of, in 1985 and again in 20, 2013, uh, when the next effort was made to create a classification system. And they were, they were, they were different. Uh, in 1985, uh, it, was, it was really the slippery slope argument was constantly being invoked that if we do this, we are surely headed down the slippery slope to pre-war norms. And pre-war norms were uh, abhorrent uh, to the majority of the Japanese population. In 2013, um, that wasn't quite the case. It wasn't the case, certainly not the case to the same extent. So you, you would hear talk about slippery slope, but mostly um, there was concern that Perhaps the law was too, uh, the draft of the law w- was, was too strong. Uh, it, it called for you know, draconian measures against leakers and so forth. And the government was responsive to that to, a, to an extent that you know, surprised some people. I wouldn't say to a sufficient extent, but to a, an extent that surprised some people so that it went to public comment. The, the, the legislation was passed and took a year before it was promulgated to allow for public comment. And in the public comment, there were the concerns about um, the lack of oversight, the lack of institutionalized oversight. And so it was introduced in a form that didn't satisfy everyone, but it's there. And it was there for exactly the reason that you, Shinobu, were, were, were concerned about, which is an, yeah. attempt, an attempt to convince the Japanese public uh, that it would be okay this time. And, and there was no, they were not heading back toward militarism of the past. Right, right, right. Yeah, that, that's that's very interesting. Well, right now, still, I do worry because Liberal Democratic Party is really dominating in part because other parties are fragmented and Rike Minshto screws things up. At least that's how popular discourse goes, uh, you know, at, at the Tohoku earthquake and afterward. So uh, it appears, and also you observed the lots of candidates right now, I mean, four candidates for prime minister job appears to be in agreement that we, we should go this way. And I can see the logic behind it, but uh, there seems to be some consensus which may make this reform very effective and yet can can invite some possible, I don't know, uh, 
traps of some kind. Well, so now here we have a few questions. So uh, let me not uh, monopolize this time. So one question, uh, you mentioned that early on, Japan was focused on human intelligence. How are they adapting to insights from advanced technologies, data analytics, machine learning, et cetera? Japan may lag the United States in this respect. Does the Japanese intelligence community seek to close that gap? What steps are, the, are being taken? Uh, that's by David. Thank you, David. Um, um, first, let me just respond to Shinobu and then let me go to, to David. Um, very briefly, yes, the four candidates agree um, uh, that Japan needs to be uh, more muscular and that the constraints need to be all lifted and, and put in the rear view mirror um, and put, put aside. Uh, and, you know, that's not, that's not because, uh, let me just say that is because uh, uh, we have, you have uh, China to thank for that, the rise of China and the relative decline right. of the United States vis-a-vis -a, -vis, uh, a risen China. Um, there's a lot of concern and, and it's, it's understood that there's a lot of catching up to do, which is to get to David's question. Um, there are certain areas where, where the Japanese, uh, Japanese intelligence technology seem, and that's all secondhand for me. Let me just say one other, let me say something about that. This book was about intelligence reform, both because of its inherent, inherently being interesting to me, but also because I, you know, I don't have any clearances and I'm not, um, I wouldn't be able to do an effective evaluation of those, uh, of, of, def of defense or, or intelligence technologies in any event. So everything I say is second or third hand here and, and should be taken with you know, the appropriate discount factor, the, the discount factor that you're, you're, comfortable, you're comfortable with. But on, on new technologies, you know, signals intelligence is not new. Uh, for, as I said, for the Japanese, they've had a robust signals intelligence capability for, you know, for more than a century, but certainly in the post-war, signals and image uh, intelligence, uh, once the, the, uh, the, defense, uh, the defense intelligence headquarters was stood up, um, have been quite sophisticated. Um, and uh, there is some sharing reported um, between Japan and the, the Five Eyes, uh, between Japan and the United States through their GSOMIA agreement and not quite so much between Japan and South Korea, which have a GSOMIA agreement, all this an intelligence sharing agreement. Um, but as on the, the, the sexier uh, intelligence technologies, the currently sexier ones like artificial intelligence, cyber intelligence, and that sort of thing, uh, the Japanese are indeed playing catch up. There is indeed a gap that, that David identified. And, um, and there is indeed uh, an acknowledgement and a recognition that there is. And so therefore you're beginning to see new institutional formations, groups, units uh, within the Ministry of Defense, um, within uh, you know, other intelligence agencies. You know, Japan has about five uh, major intelligence agencies and they're all uh, paying attention to this. But the ones that are, are particularly, have been identified in public as particularly weak has been cyber. And, uh, and Japanese companies um, have been the targets of relentless cyber attacks, ransomware attacks and so forth. And so they're working very hard, very hard on that. And one solution uh, is to, you know, to get back to the five eyes. One solution that's often suggested is that Japan can bring its very sophisticated uh, signals and image uh, capabilities uh, to, uh, to the five eyes and share that in exchange for a better uh, cyber uh, and, and other uh, advanced technological uh, tools uh, for intelligence. Thank you. Uh, let, let me, well, I, I have my own question, but let me move on. Uh, Alison Alexi is asking a question uh, about Rachimondai. So let me read it. Thank you for your presentation. I'm thinking in the writing now a bit about Rachimondai and would appreciate hearing more of your thoughts 
about how those incidents were enabled or allowed by Japanese intelligence or politicians. But I, I didn't catch the name of the questioner. Alex? Oh, was... Alison Alexi. Oh, uh, Alexi. Alexi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a, she's a professor in. Right. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I just didn't catch it. I, I apologize, yeah. Alison. Um, so uh, there's a lot there, and there's probably a lot more there than I was able to. Uh, to uncover uh, when I was doing the field work for this. Um, but the, what was going on um, originally, um, or let me put it differently, the first, the first uh, inkling that the Japanese got that these, uh, these young folks were being abducted uh, to North Korea came from smuggled messages um, that were discovered actually by um, uh, uh, were given to a, a Communist Party uh, member, uh, and it was printed in the Sankei Shimbun in a New Year's Day. I don't have the I don't have the year off the top of my head, but in a New Year's Day um, edition, and it was promptly ignored. Uh, but rumors uh, began circulating uh, that the LDP, the DPJ. Uh, and, and as I said before, even the Communist Party had their own um, equities that they were pursuing in North Korea and therefore had incentives uh, to ignore what they were hearing and any confirmation that they were getting uh, from the intelligence community. And so I, I direct you to, the, to that chapter of the book uh, and to the footnotes there uh, so to get a feeling for at least what I was basing uh, this, conclusion, this conclusion on. Uh, at a certain point, you hear it often enough from enough in people independently that you begin to believe there, there may be a there there. And um, if so, uh, it was very disturbing. There was a very famous trip in which, um, oh, why am I blocking now? I'm having a senior moment for the LDP. Uh, the, the inheritor of the Takesh Taha, um, uh, it'll come to me, who, who went to North Korea had very good relationships with North, North Korea. He brought Ozawa Ichido with him, who by that time was in the Liberal Party. Um, and, uh, and I think Doi Pakakosan went as well um, and uh, on, a, on a mission. And this is at a time when the rumors, the warnings uh, were becoming harder uh, to, to ignore, as I understand it, um, by, uh, by the Japanese political class. So there, there was uh, there was a lot going on. It wasn't just this one note, obviously, but but other other evidence that was that was being relegated uh, to the background. But it was, in, it was inconvenient truths, is I guess the best way to think about it. Thank you. So now, uh, next question is by Sydney Foster. As Japan had started to reimagine their constitution to allow for more militaristic endeavors. Do you think this is a natural progression from the earlier post-war restrictions, or do you think it will continue beyond that scope? In other words, would you anticipate Japan going beyond that catching up? That's a, that's a good question. I tried to anticipate that in my remarks um, by mentioning that all of those changes you know, whatever the, the Naikaku Hosei Kyoku, the Cabinet Legislation Bureau said uh, about what was constitutional and what was not constitutional um, uh, had been, you know, tossed, mostly tossed away or at least is, uh, locutionally somersaulted. I don't know what the right, right metaphor is here, um, but there were so many elements, um, not just the constitution, it was sort of an anti-military, what Tom, Thomas Berger talks about as an anti-militarist sentiment, which was very strong. It, it still exists, I'm not suggesting that it's gone. But, um, but the point I was trying to make in the talk and that I would return to here is that you didn't need a change in the constitution to eliminate many of the most important constraints. I mean, the debate right now about deep strike uh, missiles, uh, missile capabilities as a deterrent is, is something that um, was inconceivable uh, when 
it was the, the cabinet legislation bureau's uh, ruling uh, that there that you could not have offensive capabilities. I mean, one by one, offensive capabilities were uh, admitted into uh, the you know the Japanese military. It's it, you know it's starting with uh, starting with um, uh, aerial refueling. Um, suddenly, you could have aerial refueling. It had been ruled out. Now it was ruled in. Um, aircraft carriers now have aircraft. You have aircraft carriers retro the Izumo class. Um, you know they were for helicopters, but now they have hardened decks and and they they're useful for and and, and compatible with F thirty five Bs. So, uh, you know attack fighters, jet fighters. So and now uh, and, and of course now anyway the point is that I think Japanese politicians although they will pander in the LDP they will pander to a constituency that wants the reform of the constitution. Um, I don't think that many or even a majority in the LDP, and I've not done a survey, but I'm guessing that people would be in, in the LDP are satisfied with the fact that they have enormously greater degrees of freedom now to do things uh, that had been once ruled out. Um, collective self-defense is another example. Uh, I, I've talked, I, I made that list. So, uh, you know, the point is uh, that, uh, a lot, I call your attention to this. I, I haven't followed the, the campaign all that closely at this point. I will, after the 29th, follow it more closely, but I don't hear a debate within the LDP about the need to revise Article 9. I think there's, there's an acceptance of the fact that they would like to see it happen, but it doesn't sound like there's an urgency uh, there, there was, there seemed like an urgency for Prime Minister Abe, um, but uh, I, I think that that's sort of uh, receded. And so it's the issue, I guess the point for Sydney is that the issue is not so much Article 9, but what uh, 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 the national military can and cannot do. And the things that it cannot do are, uh, are, have rapidly uh, been cut away. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, interrupt very quickly with my own question. So you talked about this uh, salami slicing uh, after, you know, over decades. And at the very beginning, you drew contrast between Japan against Germany, uh, I remember. Uh, so the process is uh, how to compare Germany and Japan in, in respect to this reform or build up of military capabilities uh, after the World War II. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, just to be really clear, I, I wasn't comparing Japan to Germany when, oh, I mentioned, I when I mentioned salami tactic. I simply said that the metaphor is a German metaphor. It, oh, it, I see, okay, yeah, well, it, it, sure. it's, still, it's still a good question, which, which I'll take up, but just to, just to be clear, it, the salami tactic is a German concept. And, and it's just, it just means you have this big, in, in the case of Japan, and here's a mixed metaphor, uh, and I admit to being metaphorically challenged, so what are we gonna do? But it's, it's uh, a mixed metaphor. It's the salami tactic is one after the other, slicing away the pacifist, right. the pacifist loaf, the pacifist salami until there's no more pacifism. Um, that's the metaphor. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not intended to be specific to, uh, in every in every respect to reality, but it is it is a metaphor that I think works, so I use it. Contrast to Germany, that's 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 one that we often hear, and and uh, um, and and the Germans' um, response to to uh, to the war and the Japanese official response to the war, not public opinion, um, but but official response to the war, um, uh, have been quite different. It, it didn't take too long. Uh, for the Germans uh, to uh, uh, re, re, reinvent and reestablish uh, their military and establish it within the context of NATO, which meant that uh, there was always uh, collective self-defense was, was always acceptable, uh, at least once NATO was, was in place, that it was acceptable. Um, that, that, um, that was a battle 
uh, that, that wasn't resolved until, was it, uh, 2016 um, uh, by the Japanese. Uh, the, the, the Germans, uh, there's always, the, this, all, this debate always comes up when we discuss re Germany's relationship to its neighbors. Um, and Japan and compare it to Japan's relationship to its neighbors and the, the fact that its neighbors are, are never quite satisfied uh, with Japan's apologies, uh, that, arguing that they're insincere and, and facile, whereas uh, Germany has, uh, has made its peace um, and, and in, in a very uh, deep way. So it's a deep reconciliation, not just an effort to reconcile, which we have to acknowledge the Japanese government has done efforts to reconcile. They haven't been accepted. It's been unrequited for, for reasons we can get into when we talk about regional politics. But in Germany, it was a deep uh, and, and, and substantive and lasting reconciliation um, that had to do with compensation uh, for, for slaves, compensation uh, for uh, the devastation wrought uh, on its neighbor's citizenry and its own uh, citizenry. So um, it, they're very different cases, and, and I'm not saying anything that others haven't said many times more eloquently in the past. Okay, thank you. Now, Josh Hausman, uh, I was wondering if you could say a little more about counterintelligence in Japan. Presumably, uh, other countries have extensive intelligence operations in Japan. I wonder how Japan approaches that fact. Well, the the thank you, Josh. The the uh, the main counterintelligence unit in Japan is a, a part of the Ministry of Justice. So this is this is the silo, the silo story. The United States has fifteen or seventeen different intelligence. We, we know about silos. Um, actually, let me go. Let me step back, and then I'll, I'll answer Josh's question directly. But this is worth pointing out that silos are endemic in intelligence communities everywhere at all times. And there's a reason for that, which is easily understood, which is that, that intelligence is supposed to be done secretly. I mean, the, the idea, intelligence is getting secret secretly. Um, and, uh, and it's supposed to be secret. And so you don't sort of talk to colleagues outside the, you know, the, the bubble in the unit you're in anywhere, in any intelligence where you're not supposed to. And that's led to a, an awful lot of problems in the United States, in particular, the greatest, most tragic recent one, uh, of course, was 9-11, uh, was when CIA had a bead on um, the Al-Qaeda operatives who were in the United States, didn't report it. Uh, uh, F F I'm sorry, the FBI had it, didn't report it to CIA um, for a variety of institutional and structural reasons. In any event, we all know what, what, what happened as a consequence, well, Japan um, is, you know, is 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 tatewari on steroids, if you like. It, it, it's all everything, every institution in Japan, you know, that I've ever studied. You know, one of the first things you encounter is somebody talking about tatewari gyose, uh, tatewari mondai, tatewari no heigai. You know, you, you hear this all the time. So that's that's fine, um, but. Uh, it's not so. It's not surprising to see it in in Japan. So, okay, counterintelligence. Counterintelligence you'll find in the police, but uh, you'll also find in in uh, PSIA, uh, the the Public Security uh, in, in Intelligence Agency, and that's in the Justice Ministry. Um, they were the ones. As I, I introduced them only once in my talk, uh, in talking about uh, Ohm Chinukyo and the fact that they didn't go out and pull the plug uh, on, on its leadership uh, and its organization before uh, the murders in March of, of 1995. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, re the result of not acting sooner was, uh, was a tragedy. Um, it, was, it was a tragedy. So um, counterintelligence has always been made more difficult, not just by the silos, um, uh, but, but also by um, the reading by counterintelligence officials of the mood uh, in Japan. Uh, the anti-militarist mood, 
the fear, this goes all the way back to Shinobu San's question at the beginning, the fear that um, giving them too much power to act uh, in, in a counterintelligence domain uh, would be uh, redolent of wartime uh, Japan and, uh, and dangerous. And so they've tiptoed. They tiptoed for a very long time. Also, um, there were problems they perceived in the counterintelligence community with uh, uh, coalition governments so that the LDP was not always governing on its own. And so they felt that there would be breaks put on on the LDP to make, uh, to make their actions um, illegal uh, or, or to reduce their degrees of freedom. So they were very cautious. Um, the best source of, or at least the most entertaining source of information on counterintelligence is to read the memoirs of the, of the Russian, the then Soviet uh, spies who owned Japanese politicians, Japanese journalists, Japanese government officials during the Cold War. Um, they're very frank about it. It's in English. I don't read Russian. Uh, it, it's in English. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating. And that, that's where they talk about spy heaven, uh, because they did it for a long time with impunity. And uh, they, were getting, they were getting the information they needed by turning uh, these, these folks, again, the, the, the journalists, the uh, socialist politicians, some LDP politicians, um, and, and so forth. Um, so uh, I, think, I think a book, I don't, I don't know if, 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 uh, if Josh is writing a book uh, or a dissertation or a paper on this, but I think it would be a great topic to dig more deeply into than I was able to in this book. Thank you. Here's a question from Ann Sheriff. Oh, hi, Ann. Uh, oh. Are you okay? All right. So let me read the question. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk and the preview of your book. In your talk, you emphasize the role of the broad public opinion in shaping the Japanese intelligence, <laughs> and in particular, mistrust based on wartime experiences. Would you talk more about the role of generational change within the intelligence community itself? in promoting changes in intelligence community. In other words, why generational differences within the intelligence community is significant in terms of policy change? That's a terrific question. And, and hello, Ann, I haven't, we haven't worked together in years. I, I'm glad to hear from you. I'm glad you're in on, the, uh, on this call. Um, so generational change, I, there's, there's a number of ways to think about uh, generational change, and some of them may be, one or more of them may be more uh, congenial to the, the discussion of intelligence, the intelligence community. But just briefly, uh, one is sort of Mannheim. So the idea that when you're between 18 and 22, uh, you have a formative experience. Say in, in, in my generation, it was the Vietnam War, and my father's generation it was the Great Depression. Everyone has, you know, in, in the Japanese case, you know, people's grandfathers, it was the Pacific, Asia Pacific War and so forth. So you have, you have formative experiences that shape your, uh, your, your point of view, either, you know, what, however, pro or con, whatever the, the nation's policy was. So there's this, this, um, this fixed idea about a generation. It gets fixed as, and, and stays, with that generation as it ages. But then there's this notion of maturation. So that, you know, in your 20s, you know, you, you are, you know, the old expression is if you're not, if you're not a, a revolutionary in your 20s, you have no heart. If you're still a revolutionary in your 40s, you have no head. You know, we hear that all the time. But that's, that's the idea of, of a maturation, of a change in, uh, in, 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 in a single generation, a change of views. And, and the third, I guess, is, is sort of this back and forth, the pendular kind of a model where, where people, um, they just, they're opposed to what their parents were, were, were in favor of. And, and then their kids are opposed to, to what they're in favor of and so forth. Anyway, it seems to me that in the case of the intelligence community in Japan, 
Um, I think there's, I, I step outside the intelligence community per se to the, the Japanese public. I think there's a, a maturation process. There's been change. Maturation gives them credit for becoming more mature. That's not what I mean. It's just that it's changed over time. And, and um, that change is, is important and it, it's changed as a consequence of changes in the environment. And so uh, if you go, so I think that, that, model, that model works pretty well because for a long time, it was the first model. It was that fixed Mannheim, Mannheimian model where uh, individuals who came of age uh, during the Asia Pacific War, uh, who fought in the war, actually Gotoda Masaharu did, and he was famously pacifistic. Um, but it, it, anyway, um, these uh, these folks um, may may be aging out, in, in, and the general population is more accepting of of the need for uh, a a capable. Uh, intelligence community. And, and part of that has to do not just with the change in the regional security environment. Well, it has everything to do with the change in the regional security environment, which includes not just the rise of China, but as I said before, the relative decline of the United States. There's so much resentment. There was so much resentment of the dependence of within the Japanese intelligence community on, uh, on the United States. Um, and I think that is dissipated. Um, the, the, the Japanese government continues to depend upon the United States, but the balance of trade in, in intelligence is no longer uh, as one side. It's, 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 it's still, of course, uh, the Japanese side is more dependent on US intelligence than vice versa. And it doesn't get everything clearly because it's not in the five eyes. But, um, but it's less dependent on the United States than it used to be. And the United States uh, values uh, Japanese intelligence more uh, over, has begun to, uh, to value Japanese intelligence more over time, I'm told. Um, I have no personal knowledge of this, and, and, uh, but that's certainly the impression. So that we have this, we have generational change for sure. Um, the open discussions about intelligence reform that, that started happening by that last period, the reimagining period that I talked about, um, are, are they're very real and they could not have happened uh, 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier. They just, they, they not only could not have happened, they didn't happen and they could not have happened. So I, we do see generational change, I think, and an acceptance in the general public Without regard for whether or not there remains an anti-militarist sentiment, I think there still does. But, but I think I think folks understand uh, and accept. Let me put it differently: they, they accept more than ever before in the post-war uh, the need for competent, capable, um, vigilant uh, intelligence. Thank you. Now here's another question uh, by Benjamin Peters, Edward Snowden who lived and worked in Japan for a time, has made claims about Japanese and the US massive surveillance programs aim, aiming at the Japanese public. Do you think his claims about mass surveillance were particularly revealing and or damaging? And how would you characterize the reaction of state level state level actors and the Japanese public to his claims? What a great question. Thank you, Benjamin. That's a great, that's really terrific because um, Snowden's revelations were enormously consequential in the United States. Um, the, the government took it up. Uh, the, the, I should let's say the political class took it up and then Congress took it on and so forth. Uh, uh, there's issues of mass surveillance of meta you know, uh, meta uh, surveillance of telephone and other communications and, and so forth. That was without Snowden's revelations, we wouldn't have known what was going on. I guess through the, it was the Patriots Act, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't followed the American case all that closely, but clearly it had an impact in the United States. And I think Benjamin is right that in the Japanese case, we don't see, I haven't, I didn't hear anyone over the course of 
the time I was doing the field work, um, spend much time talking about Snowden um, in Japan. And uh, does that mean that, that uh, they accept uh, and approve mass surveillance? I think not. I think they're probably uh, concerned about um, talk about changing uh, uh, the intelligence, reforming the intelligence community overtly in a direction that acknowledges uh, Snowden and, and, and his revelations. I don't know that, uh, but I think it's really worth, it's worth investigating. Uh, and it would be my guess that that's the case. Um, the, the other thing is that some of the people, many of the people I spoke with um, uh, would be happy uh, with a stronger rather than a weaker uh, counterintelligence capability in Japan. And therefore, um, this would be uh, anathema going after it and reducing it at a time when the overall intelligence community is, is being bolstered uh, would be uh, not something that they would be enthusiastic for. Thank you. Now, uh, Stephanie Narukawa is asking the following. There may, this may be hard to answer, uh, but when it comes to Article 9, what will happen to the US intelligence if it were removed? Good question. I, I, yes, it's hard, to, it's hard to answer. I don't know. Uh, we can think about that out loud. Um, if that were removed, uh, if Article 9 were, Article 9 was just removed completely, um, I guess, is that That's what she is asking. I, I think that this is a counterfactual question. It's just- So it's clearly, that. it's clearly yeah. counterfactual. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's, let's play with it that way. Um, so if there was no Article 9, um, but there was uh, a, you know, something in the constitution that acknowledged so that Japan has the, the right to self-defense, because my guess, I, I, I can't do a counterfactual that's completely unimaginable. So we'll do the counterfactual in which the, which the, the, the current, current Article 9 doesn't exist, but uh, Japan uh, has the right to self-defense. So therefore you have a self-defense force uh, or a military um, of some kind like any other country. Uh, and then the question is what happens to the American intelligence capabilities? Well, I think, I think it depends upon a bilateral negotiation right now. Uh, and that's been true for actually, frankly, for a long time. The, the United States isn't just imposing listening posts on the Japanese. The Japanese and the United States come to an agreement uh, on uh, new listening posts, new technology in the listening posts, whatever it is. Uh, the US, it's not an equal, you know, it's not a dance of, of equals necessarily. I, I get that. Uh, but it would depend upon what happens to the alliance per se. So we'd have to also imagine that Japan not only has the right to, constitutionally to have self-defense, but also that there is no alliance. If there's no alliance, then there's, there's probably not, there's no American listening posts that were many fewer listening posts. Um, you know, the, the United States has listening posts around the world, but they're mostly in, in allied, allied countries, uh, but they're always under, well, who knows? I don't know the answer to this. Uh, but I, but the, I presume that the largest majority of these uh, capabilities are uh, negotiated with host, with host governments. And so I don't see anything in the question or in the counterfactual that rules out the possibility of enhancing or continuing at least uh, intelligence cooperation. We, there is a GSOMIA. I mean, it's not like the United States and Japan don't have an intelligence sharing, a formal intelligence sharing capability. And that has nothing to do with Article 9. So, you know, you'd have to take away that formal intelligence sharing agreement, the GSOMIA, uh, before you could posit the end of American, uh, of American uh, capabilities on the archipelago. Okay, thank you. Uh, here, Todd, Maslik, uh, thank you for such an interesting talk. Could you comment on existence of 
or existence of intelligence corporations in the early period, for example, perhaps as part of the Anglo-Japanese alliance or the absence thereof. I think he's asking potential cooperation in the intelligence area between Japan and Britain right. uh, very early on. Right, no, it's a good question. I, you know, I can only answer in the negative uh, because I don't know um, what kind of intelligence cooperation the Anglo-Japanese Alliance included. And I never encountered an account, I never read an account that included a discussion of Anglo-Japanese intelligence cooperation. My guess is there was, there must have been uh, some, and it would have been through military channels. So the military intelligence, maybe, maybe diplomatic channels, but uh, you know, I, I just don't know. When it comes to uh, intelligence between Japan and, and Great Britain, you fast forward to a point where the Japanese were allied with the anti um, anti uh, British forces, revolutionary forces in Malaysia, in Burma, in in India, in South in South Asia, in particular, uh, and those were there was lots of cooperation there, but it was aimed at not with um, uh, Great Britain. Okay, great. Uh, Yuki Shiraito uh, is kind of following up on my early point, uh, asking more very specific, interesting questions. So to what extent uh, is the Japanese intelligence community still dominated by Koan Keisatsu, public division of the police, which is an organizational descendant of Toko Keisatsu, special higher police as Gotoda's important role seem to have demonstrated. How are JSDF, MOF, and others charging, changing power balance within the community, if any, and which direction do you think it is going? So that's part one. Part two uh, is the following. Is there any law that specifically authorizes covert and intelligence operation, covert intelligence operations domestically or abroad by those agencies. What is the administrative legal base, administrative legal basis for their activities, if there's any? That's terrific. Um, thanks, Yuki. Uh, the the role of the police is really interesting. Um, I mentioned it, I think, only once in my talk it, it it's this is the first the first question i mentioned it only once in my talk but it's it infuses any history of the japanese intelligence post-war japanese intelligence community well pre-war too i talk about toke and in in that but look i you know um i think uh although it's not acknowledged as a general matter that putting the police in charge of intelligence rather than because, putting them in charge because they were the descendants of the bad guys um, is not the way to look at it. I think they were put in charge as, as part of a, a broader effort to maintain civilian control of the military. And the cops are considered civilians, not, uh, you know, not military even though some wear uniforms. And the point is um, that, and, and it was a surprising point for me, which is that, that every time there was change addition to the, the Japanese intelligence community in, in the post-war period, um, it included negotiations between MOD or earlier JDA, the Japan Defense Agency before it became a ministry um, and uh, the police agency um, and the head of uh, CSIRO, I didn't even mention CSIRO, the, the, the Cabinet Intelligence Research Office, which for many years was considered Japan's CIA, but you know, it, was, it was a false comparison because it was hardly centralized and so hardly as powerful as, anyway. But CSIRO has always been under the, uh, and still is under the um, supervision of a police officer, a senior police officer. So um, that goes on 
Uh, and I think it's not because of the legacy of, of uh, hyper surveillance at home. I think it's, it's part of the legacy of civilian uh, control, the desire for, by the political class to ensure civilian control of the military. I could be wrong about that, but that's the way I, I like to think of it. And in terms of this, in this last question, um, whether or not there's a law that allows for covert activity at home or abroad, uh, I don't know of any. Uh, I, I probably would have heard of one. I don't think that's the way it's done. Um, the, uh, the Chinese don't think that's the way it's done. They've been arresting Japanese, uh, Japanese citizens taking pictures uh, near, near bases in China. There are a bunch of them in in jail, um, and, and, and in fact, university professors, well, we know that, but, but the, the, the point is that um, to the extent there's any covert activity, um, it's not something that's grounded, as I understand it, not something that's grounded um, in regulation, legislation, or, or, or legal base recognized by the, you know, Naikaku Hosei Kyok. All right, thank you. Uh, well, time is uh, winding down, but there's one really interesting question from Anne Sheriff, and I'd like to finish this session with her question. Do you have any recommendations for any Japanese spy novels? <laughs> I, I found this rather interesting because I don't know. Uh, you know, when you take airplanes, I, I end up uh, watching, you know, spy movies. No, there are lots of spy movies from the West, but not from Japan. And I found the question quite interesting. What is your reaction? Well, I mean, look, the, the fact that you haven't found it and you don't know of it is reassuring to me because I was going to say, I, I don't know, I haven't found it, I don't know of it. Oh, okay. I mean, the, the, the point is that you don't see those spy movies much, at least about post-war Japan, uh, because they haven't been made and they haven't been made uh, because Japan, it, 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 everyone who talks about this recognizes that, that human intelligence is, is an Achilles heel uh, for, for the Japanese. To the extent that human intelligence exists, it's, it's, over, it's in a non-intelligence unit, uh, which is JETRO, uh, and it's in the economics you know, it, it's an economic, it's not military, it's not, it's economic security to the extent that it exists, mm -hmm. you know, the, and, 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 and that's a whole separate uh, piece of research and worth talking about. I, I talk about it in the book, um, but uh, I apologize. I don't know uh, of a book to recommend it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating talk and very lively stimulating conversation. Thank you very much, Professor Samuels. It's my great pleasure and, and thank, you great for to have you. Thank, thank you for you hosting much. me. Bye-bye.